there's also many manifestations of these kinds of group dynamics that people have tried to recreate in the scientific laboratory uh, in people to try to understand kind of how strong these forces are. And a lot of these are kind of classic studies from the 50s and 60s where, uh, you know, after the horrors of World War II, uh, psychologists really tried to run experiments to try to understand, you know, what's going on? What are, the, what are these forces? And so one of the most uh, kind of notorious, well-known examples is the Stanford prison experiment. And this is where they had, a, you know, college kids assigned, randomly assigned to, to play these different roles, either of being a kind of prison guard or a prisoner. And uh, what, what uh, Phil Zimbardo, who ran this experiment, uh, found was that, you know, kids really took on these roles kind of to a, to a great degree and really became essentially kind of very mean and dehumanizing towards their prisoners. And the prisoners kind of, you know, uh, took on this role of being meek and uh, kind of following orders from their from their guards. Uh, it turns out that there was a little bit of like, you know, some coaching and some other weird stuff going on uh, that, that, you know, made the experiment perhaps less uh, objective than it otherwise would have been. But uh, I think it's clear that there were some of these effects for, for real. Uh, similarly, there was an experiment uh, called the Robber's Cave Experiment in 1961 by Sharif et al. Uh, that found these kind of more Lord of the Flies type of behavior. Uh, but earlier experiments by the same group had actually found the opposite. Um, and again, there was some suspicion of coaching here. And, and so, you know, whether in a, in a kind of laboratory level experiment, you can really capture kind of the, the true horribleness of human nature uh, is, is sort of debatable. Uh, I think there's a lot of other factors going on in terms of, you know, people recognizing the different social roles they're playing and, and not completely going over into the kind of manipulation. Uh, but in any case, there clearly are some effects of these things that are tapping into real effects. And we certainly don't need to look very, very hard to see uh, all the atrocities of war and outgroup and hate that these experiments are really trying to capture. Another really notorious example is Stanley Milgram's uh, experiment where people uh, thought they were or were you know made to believe that they were shocking this other person sometimes to the point of that person becoming unconscious with this dial that said like do not go to this high level of shock it will result in death you know kind of the extent to which the the people would be uh following rules just following orders obeying what the experimental told them to do um, unfortunately, they didn't really ask the subjects, you know, if they really believed that this was happening. Probably they recognized that they're in this kind of, you know, uh, psychology experiment and they're probably being messed with. Um, and so they didn't really think they were actually shocking people. Um, but, you know, you don't know until you ask. And so, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of debate about these experiments. Like, first of all, why were they allowed in the first place? It's very traumatic. Um, you know, what are the rules for actually doing these kinds of things? How much do we, should we really try to recreate these kinds of horrible aspects of human behavior in the lab? Uh, all these really important questions about this. Um, but certainly this is, this is what gives psychology kind of its controversial, uh, name in, in, in conducting these kinds of crazy experiments. Another really interesting one from the same time period is, uh, the conformity experiment from Solomon Ash where they had uh, a group of people sitting around a table here. Um, and it was arranged that the subject, the, the participant in the experiment, the only true participant in the experiment, the rest were all Confederates, um, uh, was last. And, and everybody would go around and say, yeah, which of these stimuli here on the right and panel B best matches the, the sample in, in A? And you know, obviously, in this case, it would be the middle one. But the Confederates on a certain number of trials would, would choose one of these other ones that didn't fit very well at all. And then when it came time for the participant to kind of make their choice, 37% um, of the time they kind of said, well, gee, if everybody else is saying this, I guess I'm just going to go with what they're saying. On the other hand, 95% uh, of the subjects did deviate at least once, okay, okay. 
And again, people probably recognized that there were things going on in the experiment and they were kind of like, okay, well, what should I do? Should I just go along or should I, you know, rebel? And, and so, but in any case, we know there are strong social pressures. There's no question that that's happening. And this was just, again, a, cap a way to try to capture that in the lab. Uh, and so, yeah, th it, there's a lot of controversy about these studies because, you know, it's like how big of an effect is it and how, how, how conformist are people? Uh, and these are tough questions. I think when you talk about the real world, as opposed to these experiments, uh, again, we can see very clear examples. Uh, another big factor in social conformity is this phenomenon called groupthink, uh, where basically uh, a bunch of people trying to make decisions, working together, experience this conformity pressure from all their, their uh, peers and have a higher tendency to sort of agree with each other and it's hard to be that kind of odd person out who's like, well, wait a second, you guys, what about this, you know? Um, and, and so that creates these kind of spectacular failures of decision-making, such as the uh, uh, classic example being the Bay of Pigs disaster during the Kennedy, Kennedy administration uh, and the Iraq war, uh, lack of weapons of mass destruction uh, uh, that, you know, all the intelligence agencies had said Oh, Saddam Hussein definitely has all these weapons of mass destruction, but turns out he didn't. So uh, that is an example of a kind of collective failure. Another important uh, social effect here, widely known called the bystander effect, uh, where if you have a bunch of people, uh, there's this kind of diffusion of responsibility. People, Nobody really wants to take on this kind of leadership role and stand out and, and do something. So everybody kind of stands around looking at everybody else, waiting for somebody else to do something. Um, and so this tragic example of Kitty Genovese, uh, who was murdered in New York City in this courtyard where a lot of people could hear her screaming. Um, and the, the, the story here, again, is sort of controversial because, in fact, uh, several people did call the police uh, in response to the situation. And in fact, the police were rather slow in coming. The, the real problem was not that people didn't respond, but rather that the police didn't respond quickly. The original news story kind of fit with this overall psychological phenomenon and became this big kind of like example of, of the bystander effect. But in fact, people did act. But on the other hand, everybody has probably experienced this kind of diffusion of responsibility. Nobody's going to be the one to kind of clean up a mess or something. Uh, just let somebody else take care of it. You know, this happens all the time. And now we can talk about stereotyping and prejudice in terms of compression and categorization. Our brains are wired to try to simplify the world and, and reason in terms of these simple categories. And this applies to reasoning about groups of people. And that's what a stereotype is, is, is a way of trying to simplify our world by thinking in terms of these simpler uh, prototypical kinds of cases instead of thinking about actual people and the actual complexity of actual people. And one of the things that the modern techniques that we have now have revealed uh, is that these stereotypes are very, very pervasive and that people who are members of uh, negatively stereotyped uh, uh, groups actually uh, express the same kinds of implicit uh, stereotype beliefs as people kind of, you know, outside those groups. And so uh, this is uh, an example here of what we call the implicit association test. You try to categorize uh, a word uh, like salary by pressing uh, one of these two different buttons, okay? Um, so if salary belongs to the right, you press the I key. If salary belongs to the left, you press the E key. So here it would be uh, fitting with career. You have these different names up here also, these different categories like male, female. And if, they, if the associations kind of are consistent with the stereotype, you're faster to make these responses than if they're inconsistent. And so it's really that kind of consistency uh, between the stereotype and the overall kind of category labels here that uh, we pick up kind of just in terms of this reaction time. There's a slower versus faster response times. And that implicit uh, measure is something that you can't control, you're not aware of, and so it shows up very clearly.
to summarize, throughout our understanding of all these social phenomena, we really see a strong influence of these three C principles, compression, contrast, and control. So compression, all about this kind of uh, uh, stereotyping, the simplicity, contrast in terms of uh, social uh, comparison theory and uh, how much we're constantly comparing ourselves with others. This focus on relative rank in the social group is all these kind of contrast effects. And then control effects in terms of uh, we really want to remain in control of our own belief systems and uh, very sensitive to deviations um, between our beliefs and our behavior and in terms of cognitive dissonance. Um, and trying to always improve our self-efficacy and self-impression with impression management, downward social comparison, et cetera. So all these, these three factors are really strongly manifest in the, in the social phenomenon.